Think of a world with towering buildings, booming factories, and equal gender roles. This sounds much like the 21st century today, but society wasn't always like this. Before the 19th century, social and sexual customs were highly different from how they are today. Hi, my name is Kate Stevens, and I worked alongside Lawrence Lodige, Samantha Harker, and Jessica Whitehead to research a topic of changes involving sexuality and gender equality in the Industrial Revolution. So what exactly was the Industrial Revolution? Well, it was the process in which handmade and agricultural communities in Europe were translated into a machine manufacturing industry. And to define a sexual revolution, we said it is the liberalization of established social and moral attitudes towards sex, or in simpler terms, changes in attitudes towards sex and women's sexuality. <laughs> During pre-industrial times, factories were based in workers' homes and families worked without compensation. After industrialization, work took place in factories rather than in homes. Because of industrialization, this, worked, this resulted in a change in both men and women's roles. Based on the background of the Industrial Revolution, my group decided on the question, did the Industrial Revolution lead to a sexual revolution? And to answer this question, we researched the societal, sexual, familial, and economic points of view. Using these lens, we concluded that some historians don't believe that there was a sexual revolution following the Industrial Revolution. However, considering changes in prostitution, wages, households, and premarital sex, it is evident that a, social, that a sexual revolution occurred. Now onto the familial lens. The Industrial Revolution caused a shift in the typical household through jobs, women's roles, marriage, and the number of people in the common household. As the Industrial Revolution began, jobs and people began to move to cities and urban centers rather than staying in rural areas. This started, this moved jobs into factories rather than, in the, than staying in the homes. It made women start to work and job opportunity rose because of the factories. As job opportunity rose, financial independency in young adults uh, began and grew so that then these young adults were able to move out of their households and get married and start families sooner because they were able to afford it. This caused intergenerational co-residency to decrease. Intergenerational co-residency is the number of is the multi-generational families living in the same household together. So as young adults moved out, this caused that number to decrease. As jobs moved out of homes, there was less of a need for child labor. This meant there was less of a need for bigger families with m many children. So families grew simpler and more unstable. Jobs also changed. So as we see in this graph, farmers and other self-employed jobs decreased drastically and unskilled and skilled jobs increased. In this graph, we see women starting to work at the, in the early 1800s over here, we see the beginning of dual earning households. Some limitations of this lens are that households and jobs don't directly link to a sexual revolution, and there's no exact data on how families work together and how they communicated with each other. Now on to Jesse for the sexual lens, or for the social lens. Thank you, Sam. Looking through the societal lens, my claim is Due to the weakening of social customs led by the Industrial Revolution, there's a shift in sexual behavior causing an upright in premarital intercourse. Before industrialization, there were strict social customs, such as celibacy, but with controlled sexual activity, this led to rebellion. The rebellion that followed the Industrial Revolution is seen through a journal of a clerk named Bryceson on February 1846. He wrote, had enough in the room, not any tricks in the bed. This quote provides enough evidence to clearly see that his lover was Anne Fox, this means that they were having premarital sex. Because both men and women's workers migrated to far cities, this allowed for time away from parental supervision. Without parental super supervision, the rebellion that occurred from the Industrial Revolution caused a shift in social customs and behavior. A result of this shift is pregnancy before marriage. Evidence of this cause comes from parish registers, stating that 30 to 40 percent of women walking down the aisle were pregnant. This map provides evidence showing the population differences in Britain. The, the map shows areas that are densely populated and are industrialized. An example of this can be seen in Manchester, where a, with a population of 300,000 represented by a square that is adjacent to coal fields represented by the darker side, the darker shade of gray. Lastly, a few limitations of mine is that I have no parental viewpoint and I don't have a linear graph showing amounts of migration backing up my map.
Now on to Peyton economics. Thank you, Jesse. My claim for the economic lens was that a sexual revolution can be seen following the industrial revolution through the shifting total factor productivity rates, as well as the gap in men and women's wages. Before the 19th century, women earned around 60% of men's wages, but during the Industrial Revolution, they earned either 50% or lower. An example of this can be seen in the Landshack cotton mills in 1833. Women's wages were the highest in this area, yet females aged 16 to 21 earned $7 in three to five workdays, while men could earn $10 in only three. After the 1800s, there was a considerable increase in the total factor productivity rates, that is, the measure of productivity growth in an economy. This rate jumped from 0.1% to the modern 1% in a really short amount of time. Fertility rates were also peaking in the time period, which can contribute to the total factor of productivity rates because as the population increases, the amount of workers in the factories will also increase. Statistics on this graph show a positive increase in the population as well as the number of females in the labor force. But notice how the variables don't climb at a constant rate. This is one of the limitations of my lens. Another restraint on my lens was the amount of data about the total factor productivity and fertility relationship. Without other sources to compare my current data to, I wasn't able to analyze it to its fullest, fullest extent. Excuse me. Now onto Lauren with the sexual lens. Thanks, Kate. So how exactly? Well, how do you use this app? So how exactly did wages tie into prostitution? Well. Prostitution allowed for more money to be made by the average woman, allowing them to become financially independent, more financially independent, making way for a rise in prostitution and normalization of publicized sensuality. In 1858, there was a study conducted and more than a third of prostitutes had a personal inclination towards the easier lifestyle that it provided. This means that there was an easier workload for a larger amount of money, which led to more financial independence. The average prostitute made $2 per 15 minutes, while the average woman made 33, per th 33 cents per day. City life, possible through the Industrial Revolution, created a change in fashion trends, making women more sexualized and prone to having sex earlier in their life. Clothing became a lot more central during this time period. This is shown through the hourglass figure being popularized, creating the stereotypical attractive woman that we know today. This also led to a, a pop, uh, percentage increase of 30 to 40 percent in unmarried pregnant women, which Jesse previously mentioned, which meant that sex was no longer as stigmatized as it was before, it, and it was becoming more common. My limit, oh, sorry. This graph shows that after the Industrial Revolution, there was a steep incline in the percentage of unmarried people by the time, by the ages of 40 to 44, and this picture shows the gradual. Um, progression of the hourglass figure from the years of 1820 to 1841. My graph does not increase at a constant rate. Because of the Victorian era, there was a little dip in the amount of unmarried women because it went down because of rebellion. And there are not very many statistics about prostitution because although it was becoming less stigmatized, there was still something about it that people did not want to talk about. Our counter argument was that Although there was, a change, there was a change in circumstances rather than a change in rebellion, marriage, sex, and wages, but considering the substantial amount of changes with prostitution, households, wages, and premarital sites, it is clearly evident that a sexual revolution occurred. The significance of this topic is that this was the start of advancements in e equality in the workforce. As women started to join the workforce, this meant that they were a bigger part of the economic side of society. There was also an advancement in the lessening of, sex sti of stigmas around sex, which we see clearly through prostitution and topic and premarital sex. This um, it is also important because we can look at the data from this time period and predict cultural changes in the future based off of the technological advancements that are happening that happen at this time and so we can predict the future off of our time. Thank you. Nice, good work ladies. Let me ask you a couple of questions while you're still up there and follow up on how your group worked together. And so uh, let me start off with Lauren. 
Can you give, I give one specific way you're thinking changed in this project as a result about learning about Jesse's uh, findings within her lab? Well, Jesse found the information about the 30 to 40 percent increase in premarital sex, and I thought that was important because prostitutes were not only seen as people who had paid to have sex, were paid to have sex, but they were seen as people who were having sex before marriage. Uh, interesting, yeah, outside on the societal, that's good. All right, and then let me, uh, while we're over there, let me ask Kate, so reflecting on your colleagues' work, which one uh, had the greatest impact on your overall understanding of the problem? Well, I believe that all of our lenses greatly contributed to the entire presentation, but Sam's lens provided more of a basic understanding of our overall topic about the Industrial Revolution and the Sexual Revolution. So I believe that's why her lens had a greater impact. All right. And then let me go over to Jesse and ask him, uh, what way did you improve your ability to work in a group as a result of this project? Anything specific or new that really came out that was fresh? I wanted to be cohesive with the rest of my group, so I wanted to make sure that my lens fit with the rest of them and make sure that my um, evidence of Shonen's and Lauren's like would, would work with other lenses too, so that we could be flow, flow nicely throughout the whole entire slide. Yeah, so she did mesh really well, good. And then lastly, let me ask Sam, uh, now that you've finished your project, what, if anything, do you consider to be a gap in your team's research that if you addressed it, you would think it would give you more confidence in the, the resolution or the results you found? I feel that if we would have looked more into a counter argument, we could have made our argument stronger and made sure that we covered all points of um, a disagreeing lens. And so I think that was a gap in our research. Excellent. Very good, ladies.